I sat down and said, I think I can think of 99 ways to manage your cash flow. And I was wrong. I'm up to 135 ways you can manage your cash flow <laughs> so far. You're listening to David Safir, cash flow management specialist to fast growing and cash strapped mid sized corporations. While David's typical clients are well beyond the solopreneur stage, the strategies he shares can be used today to take you from startup through exit while helping you keep plenty of cash in the bank to keep growing. And you're about to hear them now because David is today's guest on Solopreneur Success. Welcome to the Solopreneur Success Podcast, where successful business owners gather to share true stories and sound advice to help you start and grow your own solopreneur business. Come soar with us and design the life you love. Now, here's your host, Steve Combs. Hello, solopreneurs. Today, I'm interviewing David Safir, a business cash flow management specialist. Did you know that your sales can actually outgrow your business? Some solopreneurs might just be thinking, oh, yeah, give me as many sales as I can possibly handle. But here's the thing you might be surprised to learn is many companies go through a significantly challenging time because of growth and their sales outstrip their ability to cover expenses. It's all about cash flow. And David Safir is the real life pro when it comes to cash flow management. We're going to learn a lot of great things today. We're going to share some strategies about how you can prevent, or if you're in the midst of this challenge right now, overcome this common growth challenge in today's interview. I'm really excited about this because this is going to help a lot of our members and listeners who are really growing their business, but they don't want to struggle during the growth. So David, welcome to the show today. It's great to be here, Steve. Uh, pleasure to be talking to you. I've always appreciated our relationship. Well, I, I appreciate you having uh, the time to join us today because you're a very busy guy. You, you work with very large corporations all the time on this exact topic, cash flow management. But I, I know you, you've kind of come out of the corporate world like I did, but you worked in this exact area in many ways. I'd love to hear a little bit about your backstory so our listeners can understand where you're coming from and why you have become such a pro in this area. That'd be great. You know, I started out not ever thinking I would ever do this. This is not something I said, hey, listen, when, I'm, when I grow up, I want to be a cash flow specialist. But what happened is I was at large corporations and I had general management responsibility, which meant I was responsible for the P&L, profit and loss. And so I started learning in a corporate environment all the different triggers that you can do to make more money. They, they cared more about the bottom line than the top line. So there's one hint for the listeners. It's not how much you sell, it's how much you keep, which is what most people are interested in, um, with certain exceptions, but I won't go there. So I started getting asked by friends and acquaintances, can you help me with my business? And I have done so. I've had my own consultancy since 2002. And I've done various things with it. And in the fall of 2018, I was bored. Um, I had a full-time job. And I said, I want to do something else. I want to do something part-time. What can I focus in on so I'm easier to focus? And I realized every single client I've ever worked with was a cash flow issue, whether it was sales, marketing, the finance aspect of their company or their product development. And that's how I became a cash flow specialist. I sat down and said, I think I can think of 99 ways to manage your cash flow. And I was wrong. I'm up to 135 ways you can manage your cash flow <laughs> so far. That's, that's how I came to this spot. Wow. And in the introduction, I, I kind of mentioned this that you really can outgrow in sales what you can manage because of cash crunch. Can you describe what that actually looks like in, in a real world scenario and, and so people can kind of grasp what that means? Yeah, I'd be glad to. So first of all, let me clarify. My, the companies I work with mostly are from one to $5 million. I've got this big corporate background. So one to $5 million and a lot of your listeners who people were, who are going to be hearing this are probably smaller right now. But even if you're at 10000 or $20,000, and you want to grow to 50, you can end up in a cash crunch. It's a big growth. And so where do the areas you end up with cash crunch? It all depends on how you sell and what the cost of the selling is. If you need inventory to produce anything, you have to have money, capital, 
to grow your inventory. If by selling that much, you're required to pay people, even if they're contractors, 1099, no taxes, you're gonna need capital to pay those people. If you, not just to produce, but for you to go out and sell, a lot of times the entrepreneurs are the salespeople, you've got to leave the office, which means you might not be able to produce. Whether you're a service business or you're a hard goods business, either way, you're going to need to find people to produce. And so what ends up happening is you make a sale, but you've got expenses on the front end that precede cash coming in from the client. And all of a sudden, your credit card is starting to run out. Or all of a sudden, the, the bank account is starting to run out. But, and here's the tricky part, your accountant or your own books are telling you that you're making a profit. And this is so normal for the clients I work with say, where's all my cash? It's showing that I'm making a lot of money. And then we have to go over to the balance sheet and look at where your assets are growing. Because if you have growing assets, that means you've invested your cash, you've transferred your cash into an asset, like a vehicle or like inventory. So that's one of the places your cash is going. And then the other place is, what are you paying yourself? If you're taking it out as a draw, it doesn't show up as a reduction of profit. But you know that the cash is leaving the company because it's going into your pocket. So those are some of the things that can happen as companies are growing. Yeah, that, I, I can relate to that for sure. Myself as a solopreneur, we obviously pay ourselves out of our, our company's income and mm -hmm. it goes into the bank and I say, okay, I'm going to transfer that to my personal account because that's, that's how I'm paying myself. And I, I right. do that a couple of times a month personally. And I've been fortunate that I've not hit that crunch yet, but I, but I've seen times where well, sales can vary and sometimes you might want to pay yourself more and you just can't because the money hasn't come into the first account. And that's a cash flow situation as yeah. well. And that's uh, managing your cash. You make a conscious decision to do something with your cash. In this case, do nothing. You don't take it out. But that's the mentality of cash flow management. You don't let life happen to you. You make conscious decisions. So what are some ways that somebody could recognize when they're coming into a cash crunch to kind of head it off before they get to that point? What, what's some, what, some like warning signs that say, okay, I, I need to be careful here and maybe make some adjustments earlier so I don't have a, a big pain point down the road. All right. So let's first talk about the, the lucky few that might have this cash generating machine. People who sell information products should have a fairly fixed cost. And so if you're selling a $1,000 course and it costs you literally zero incremental cost to deliver the course, you're pretty lucky. All you got to do is make a budget and stick to the budget. Most people, it's not the case. Most people, you've got three types of expenses. One is fixed cost, whether it's rent or an accountant, you pay the same amount each month. The other one would be variable costs, which would be like utility bill that you know has got a range during the course of the year. But it's, it's always gonna be coming in. The third one is random costs. And I'll even throw out a fourth one. Random costs would be like office supplies and you run out of toilet paper. Well, I should, we're in the middle of the COVID-19 <laughs> <laughs> um, epidemic. And so that, that's why it probably came to mind. But, but that's random and it's small. But the, the fourth one I'd say is random, but larger capital equipment. You and I are both sitting inside of sound studios. I've uh, got lighting. I just, you've got a very nice microphone. I'm getting mine in. Uh, I just had to buy a new computer. Those are um, random, but larger. You sort of plan out for those. Even if you just do the fundamentals of your recurring costs, and then when the, when the random stuff comes in, you look at your bank balance, but you just set, set, set up a simple thing. How much money is going out and how much money is coming in? If, if you just know those two things and you can just say by month, that gives you a really big picture. 
So what's the problem with that? The problem is nobody gets paid by month, generally. We get money in weekly. And even worse, if you got paid once a month, that would be fine. But the costs don't come in monthly. It's not like you get a big chunk of cash, then you're gonna go spend it and you're gonna have money left over with no other costs. The big challenge is it's a, more of a weekly cycle. And if you're really tight, you're gonna be wanting to look at this every day and so you try to do in a weekly and i recommend for everybody a 13-week cash flow model to be able to see what their plan their financial plan for the upcoming quarter is on a rolling basis that's interesting i've not heard of that before so what does a 13-week model look like I and mean, what are you actually tracking in there and what what's kind of part of that yeah, you know, so let's start with what you're tracking. You're tracking what I just discussed, which would be the expenses, the revenue. And then if you've got credit lines, you can actually track how much credit line you dipped into versus the actual cash accounts. And, and it goes out every single week. If you have receivables, people owe you money, you map it out. When do they owe me money? And if you have bills into the future, you map it out. And you can see a predicting you're basically predicting your cash balances over time now that might sound crazy and it might sound impossible but it's not there are a large you see that's the challenge is that it's, it's a large number but it's a small percentage of companies do this i would estimate five percent of the companies in, in the united states do this and why because they're not in trouble and so they just go, whatever, what's, a, what's in our bank account? And they do all sorts of sloppy stuff, which if you can run your business like that, that's great. But all of a sudden they run into this cash crisis. And it's, it, it, I don't want to say it's too late, but it's one of those, the saying, when's the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. When's the second best time is today. Yeah, so that, that's the situation with the cash flow model. So let's, let's say they hit that, that crunch. What are some ways that, let's say you're, listening to this and I'm like, yeah, I'm, I know exactly what Dave is talking about because I'm, I'm fighting this right now. I'm day to day trying, you know, I'm stretching just to, to, to pay the bills on time and not have the over, you know, the late fees or whatever, or trying to get my accounts receivable in or whatever that is. What, what are some ways that folks can kind of get themselves past a crisis so that their company can survive? Because this, if I'm not mistaken, companies die from this because if you don't have enough cash. You, you can't pay your bills. You can't pay your bills. You shut the doors. Yes, it, it, it's bizarre, but companies can get into trouble, deeper trouble faster by growing too fast than declining sales. And we can talk about why, but let me just point out two things you mentioned that would be indicative of that you're having cash flow problems, early warning signs. One was that your accounts receivables aren't being paid in the manner the timing that they should be, if you've got, you know, due in 10 days and it's taking 20, 30, that's a big warning sign that you will have a cash flow crunch. And then, oh, late, late bills, late, late, late fees. So, but, but let's imagine that you are having this challenge. Number one, nobody got into business to manage their cash. I'm the last one to say, hey, this is exciting. I find what's exciting to me is like understanding the workings of the business and the cash flows the results. It will take you some time to take some time out. And from the very most fundamental thing, just get a, a grid, do it on a whiteboard. I've got a whiteboard over here or do it on a big piece of paper and, and just list out. Or if you're, if you know how to use a spreadsheet, that's even better but list out week by week by week, one through 13 and just go through and off the top of your mind, if you don't have good bookkeeping, say, who owes me money? Write it down and put it in the week. The same thing with expenses. Write it down, put it in the week. Then you have some kind of an idea of what's going on. But the generally, that helps you get organized. But what we're also talking about is how do you survive? Uh, the, the answer is you need to raise cash or credit to be able to survive. And there's a lot of ways to raise cash. The first thing I look at is the internal opportunities that already exist for you as a solopreneur. One is those receivables we just mentioned. Get on the phone and have very nice conversations with your clients saying, hey, 
No to show me money. Is everything okay? What can I expect to check? And if you really want to dig into that, Jan Reeves wrote a book called Get Paid. She's out of Australia. I'd recommend, Steve, that you contact her. Let her know I sent you or sent you to her. Uh, I've done this with other people. She can do a whole podcast on how you get paid. Okay, so do that. So get yourself paid. Look at your credit lines and see if you can get additional credit. But be careful. It's a two-edged sword. And credit cards are the easiest ones to get into, but the hardest ones to get out of. Do not, under any circumstance, take what's called a merchant advance loan. Basically, they skim off the top of, if you're using a credit card, they'll take the first 20%. And everybody I've talked to who does this type of work and helps companies that are, are, are in trouble, sometimes you're in trouble because you're going down, sometimes you're growing, if they have one of these loans, it is one of the fundamental reasons they're in trouble. And they're super easy to get, super hard to get out of. Okay, so, but look at capital lines. Hopefully you've already established credit, a uh, line of credit that you can dip into uh, as needed, but then you really wanna be trying to force your way to get it paid back. And then you look at the balance sheet. The balance sheet already told you your account's receivable, and we don't have enough time. To, if people don't know what a balance sheet is, we don't have enough time to talk about that. But look at your assets. For example, if you own a vehicle free and clear, you can go and get a loan against your vehicle much cheaper than you can a credit card. So if you've got a ten thousand vehicle, the ten thousand dollar vehicle, you can go get a loan for. $8,000 or $5,000. But here's the catch. What's it going to do to your cash flow? It's going to give you a lump sum up front, but then it's going to add to your monthly burden. So you need to be able to know that you can sustain that burden until the loan is paid back down. All right? Yeah. Great point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so let's talk about some other things you can do with assets. Sell them, get rid of them. So um, you have three cars sell one of them, get the money in, and then you're turning an extra asset into working capital. But let's talk about if you have inventory, sell it. Steve, you ever run into somebody who doesn't want to sell their stuff at a discount, even if they've held on to it for a year or two years? You ever met those people? Yeah, I have, yeah. And it's it, like... Like this is worth so much more, but it's not worth anything sitting in the garage. Right. The only value to inventory is what people are willing to pay for it, not what you paid into it or what you think it is in the marketplace. This is a tough conversation I've had with some people. I'm going to lose money. You don't lose money. It, well, you can. You can literally lose money. But at this point, it's a sunk cost. And you say, I, it's more value to me as cash. Let's say it's a $100 sell, selling item that costs you $60 to produce it. So you're, you're losing out on the profit if you sell it at cost. But you're also, then you're losing out and you, you've paid, if you sell it at $50, you lose $10, right? But what from a cash standpoint, you already spent the cash. It's not going to hurt you from a cash standpoint. And you get $50 into your pocket to go out and buy the inventory that is selling. And what else do you get? You get a $10 tax deduction. And so if you're paying taxes at you get to save the, out of $10, you get a dollar or $2 that you don't have to pay taxes. Other ways to raise capital, crowdfunding. Go out and set up a crowdfunding, pre-sell something and then deliver it. There's friends and family platforms that you literally can go out and establish an account and say, okay, friends and families, if you want to invest, this is the way to do it. And we've got all the terms and conditions lined up. It goes through the third party platform and it protects both individuals and you got to be careful with that i don't highly recommend it <laughs> <laughs> yeah you could also you know, i know one thing that you you have to be careful of relationships too especially when you're talking about friends and family you don't want to yeah. get in the situation where they're like okay i'm mad at my, my sister my brother my parents or child whatever because yeah. you've not succeeded with yeah. the investment yeah i've got a good friend who um he's got a client who wants him to invest for money and he she just keeps saying find something for me I, I trust you i trust you and we were talking about it and he's going yeah she trusts me i said yeah doyle 
But if you take the money, do you trust her? Silent partners often become not so silent. So you got to be careful, very careful. I think the main point is you need to be, get creative and you're going to need to spend time and effort on this to figure out where the capital is going to come from. Oh, here's one other really good one. If you've got a hard PO, especially a purchase order, especially if it's from a large corporation or it's from a government entity, you can get a loan against the purchase order. Now, there's something called factoring, which means people owe you money and the factorer will give you part of that. That is expensive. That's going to cost you, it's, it's credit card rates, 20 to 30%. Yeah, um, there's some that are less, but it's pretty expensive. But this is literally a loan from a financial institution, a lender, who would say, okay, you've got this really good purchase order. We will lend you 25 or 55% based on your contract that you've got. And then as you deliver, they might also do it against, lend it against receivables. So you get 25% to buy materials up front or something like that. And these are just examples. Then as soon as you, you ship it, they say, great, we'll loan you 50%, you know, another 25%. And I know one really great lender, now this is for government contracts only, federal government, definitely, I don't think even state governments, they set up a, a line of credit. So when they loan you the money and then when they get, sorry, when, when you get paid, it goes back into their account, that 50%, and then they give you the other 50%. And in that way, you're not getting yourself deeper and deeper into debt. Your line of credit stays open. Very altruistic of them. They're, they're a non-predatory lender. What you're really talking about here, at least for solopreneurs, it sounds like would be basically as an advance on the accounts receivable that would be able to get cash flow in your pocket sooner might decrease your profit a little bit. But when you're talking about need to get the cash in the, into the bank, that's a good way to get that without spending an exorbitant sums. So that, so that could be a really uh, great strategy to yeah. enable continued growth without getting into a massive cash crunch. Th that's right. And, you know, and that's, you know, this is the type of stuff that, I'm giving examples, but every company is unique. Every situation is unique. And that's one of the things I do with clients is explore. Um, I'm working with a client right now going from 4 million in sales last year. He's got 7 million on the books right now. It's June 1st, $7 million that has to be delivered this year. So he's almost doubled already with his current orders and is expecting five to 7 million more. So you're talking tripling or more in one year. And so um, I'm getting familiar with the situation. We've talked to a lender that I work with all the time who's got a lot of different uh, ways he can fund these things. And we said, this is the situation. What's your suggestion? So I'm not a lending expert, but I go find somebody who is. And these are, uh, he, he's not a bank. You know, he doesn't work for a bank, but it, it's a licensed, huge lending institution. They're based on Wall Street. And they've got relationships with lots of very legitimate. So we're not talking about that there's going to be a 20% interest rate. We're talking about lines of credit against purchase orders. Exactly what I just described. Yeah. So that, that, this is fantastic. I know, I know you have a lot of good resources as well. And, and what would it take for somebody to work with you? I mean, I know a lot of solopreneurs are probably well below that $1 million threshold that you tend to work yeah. with. What would be a... a if somebody's listening to say, I would love to work with David Sevier, what would be the level of client that would be a good fit for you? I'm just curious. Well, first of all, anybody can get onto LinkedIn. I, my, my LinkedIn, just David Sevier. I think I'm the only David Sevier on there. Yeah, um, I'll put it in the, in the show notes so you can find them really easily too. Yeah. And I welcome questions um, probably about it. And I post five to seven times a week and probably... 20% of my posts are from comments or questions that people have. So I, I don't do it as much when people try to text, uh, use a chat box on LinkedIn. I just don't have the time. But if you publicly ask me a question, that's, that's social pressure. I got to answer it. <laughs> and so generally, with, in less, every single time it's been less than a week later, I will answer the question and I will tag you so you know that I've answered your question. 
Okay, so that's one way. The I actually saw it this morning. I was, I was looking at your LinkedIn this morning before our interview today, and I, I saw you how you provided an answer, and then you tagged the, in your first comment there a, a person. So I love how you do that. That's a great idea. Great, great uh, social media strategy tip there too, by the way. So for those listening, uh, pick up on that. Yeah, it, she hasn't answered back yet. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, that's, there's interesting social things going on right now because of COVID-19 and because of um, of the Black Lives Matter uh, protests and demonstrations. But I don't use, so LinkedIn is my business platform and I stick to that. So that's one way. The second way is go sign up on my, uh, on my website. Uh, I don't even have a newsletter, but I'm adding more and more content all the time. Um, hopefully within a week, for example, I will have a questionnaire if you need capital that you can, it'll tell you how to get in touch with me and I could possibly help you figure out how to get capital. My plan is to develop a standalone course that will be very inexpensive, and then also establish a, a mentoring slash mastermind 13 week program as well, that will be a little bit more expensive. My idea is not to charge three to $5,000, which is what the gurus would tell me. My idea is to be able to help more people at whatever level they can afford to do it, but a lot of free content. Go to my YouTube channel. Uh, it's got ideas, it's got interviews I've done, um, and it's all around cash flow management, some very specific topics, some general things some about mindsets, huge. I've got free ebook on my website, the one that's there right now, 10 must have cash flow management habits that every business owner should have. You don't need 10. But there's no risk, and if you implemented one this month that you're not doing, it would help you. And then if you just pick them up gradually, I'll have a new ebook out sometime in the next week or two. It's produced. Got to get up on the website. It's seven habits, no, seven steps to implementing a cash flow management system. And my articles on LinkedIn. There's all sorts of material I'm putting out there. And it's it's meaty. Um, my father keeps saying, David, you should be selling this stuff. I'm like, yeah, dad, that's not how it works. You know, I'm going to give people, and my goal is to help 100 million businesses by 2030. And I'm not going to do that by selling. It's going to be giving away free because most businesses cannot afford to hire me. And I'm looking at a global footprint because I've been a global business person and I know the struggles, not only in the United States, but other countries, but they're, they're, they parallel. Getting started as a solopreneur is probably the hardest thing that anybody can do. But the benefits to an individual's family and their personal feelings about themselves are such an enormous payoff that I encourage them if they've got the right mindset and if they're in the right niche, it, it can be a beautiful thing. Yeah, obviously, I 100% agree with that statement clearly, and uh, I, that's that's all I'm all about is helping solopreneurs to get started. And speaking of David's training, I just want to point out because we're doing this interview today is June 4th as we actually record this, but I intend to have this live so you can listen to this and be aware that David's actually coming on to our Solopreneur Success Connections community to do a training. And for all members, that's free. And if if you listen to this podcast or just keep listening to the end of this podcast. There's a code where if you're not already a member, you can get your first 30 days free, which means listening to this, sign up today for free, and you could join David and I. David's going to deliver a personal training where you can actually ask him questions live on his spot, too, on June 25th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And if you miss it, we'll have it recorded. You can still join later, but I, I would hope that if you listen to this in time, that you would join us for that live training because it's going to get into the nitty-gritty of cash flow and how, you know, if you have a specific question, um, you could ask David directly uh, right there during that training. And that could be very, very helpful to you and your business. And even if you're not in a cash flow crunch now, attending that training is going to give you more detail than you've heard today on how to provide for a smooth growth pattern in your business so you can grow without hitting that cash flow crunch. And you've heard some great tips already today. Take it up a next notch and get some of that free training. David, you also have a, a free ebook I noticed on your site already. That that website, yep. uh, davidsafir.com. I'll put that in the show notes. But tell us a little bit about, about the ebook you have there. I just noticed that this morning too. 
Yeah, that's the 10 Habits ebook. Um, and what they are is no risk. It's not going to cost you anything to do this um, that you can implement on your own. And they're habits that can really lead you to cash management success. Um, I'll throw out one. Again, I recognize the fact that nobody gets into business to manage their cash, do bookkeeping, et cetera. But uh, one of them is keep a clean set of books. You know, we talked about what do you do when you've got a cash crunch from growth and, oh, I'll go borrow some money. If you do not have up-to-date books, and we're at least for the last quarter, so we're in June, that would mean through March, or possibly the lender would say, no, I want it through the last end of the last month. If you don't have that, forget about getting a loan. It, it will not happen. And then you're going to be scrambling to get your books caught up and it's a waste of time. You won't remember the transactions. They won't be accurate. So that's number one. Figure out a way to keep your books up to date. Weekly is preferable, but um, if not weekly, then bi-weekly or monthly. Absolutely monthly. Yeah, at the very um, least, you're reconciling your bank account every month. That should be a good time to go ahead and get your books caught up. Yep, absolutely. Um, so that's number one. Number two is have a metrics, sorry, a dashboard. It can be as simple as, again, the whiteboard saying, okay, these are the three things I want to make, want to look at. Generally, people are very concerned about sales. It could also be tracking your bank balance on a little graph. It could be your accounts receivables. If you have accounts receivables, highly recommend every week you are looking at who hasn't paid you yet and do not wait. It, and, and figure out if you have to hire somebody to make those pleasant phone calls do it. My experience has been that if you've got a big accounts receivable, worked with a company, I said, so there was enough accounts receivable. They were going to run out of cash to pay payroll in two to three weeks. And they had enough accounts receivable that it could pay for payroll two or three times. So, so what do people say when you call them? And the president said to his, his CFO or account controller, so yeah, what do they say? And the controller said, well, I don't call them. <laughs> they never, they never called. So over the next two days, they did a calling campaign and a huge number of people either didn't know they owed money, they, or they made payments arrangements with where they paid part up front and, you know, made arrangements for the rest where there were problems with the invoice. So it went to the bottom of the pile and they didn't feel any obligation to call to say, Hey, I've got a problem with the invoice. So it was probably over 50% of the money we had in within a week. And probably the other, another 30% was scheduled. And we're talking people walking in with checks saying, I'm so embarrassed. And so this is why you treat them nicely every week, do this stuff. So those are the types of habits that are simple, small, no risk, that if you do this, even without setting up a 13-week cash flow management system, you're going to improve your cash flow systems. But I'm sure setting up a 13, nah, that's, that's not it. That's in my seven steps to cash flow management system. Uh, that's certainly one of them. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And honestly, that's, that's not a far stretch to imagine for solopreneurs. I know a lady right now who is is crazy busy solopreneur. She has literally right now, I know for a fact, hundreds of thousands of dollars in invoices outstanding that she just doesn't follow up with. Uh, she doesn't need the money because she's sitting well, but at the same time, it's just not been a priority to her. Her daily work is her priority. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of person to, you know, maybe hire somebody <laughs> to get that taken care of. That's just mm -hmm. money sitting out there that's not, not even in your bank, but it could be. And that's yeah, just craziness. It, that's not a maybe. I, I mean, to me, it's like if she doesn't care about that. Then find somebody who needs the work and you can bless somebody's life and say, come on in. I'll pay a minimum wage but you get five or 10% of everything that comes in the door and it's a win-win. I mean, yeah, definitely. If, it, if it's legal to do that, that, that might, no, it should be, it should be because there's collection agencies, but they're licensed. If it's legal to pay commissions on receivables, but no one's going to complain if you're doing it nicely. That's, that's the big issue. Right. And yeah. Sometimes it's just a matter of systems and processes and getting things set yeah. up, but, but Dave, this has been a great conversation. I, I understand you actually have another commitment coming up here. I've, I've loved our conversation today. 
Little Looking more. forward to our training on the 25th. Uh, so make sure you come out for that. Make sure you check out the show notes. I'll give you the link in the outro here after the music. Make sure you listen to that. David, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very grateful we have this chant. Um, if the listeners m- might not be able to hear it, but I've got a smile on their face. I love talking about this stuff. And so I really appreciate the opportunity, Steve. Thank you for listening to the Solopreneur Success Podcast. We hope you discovered valuable advice on how to start and grow your own successful solopreneur business. If you liked the podcast, you'll love the all-new Solopreneur Success Connections community at solopreneurcoach.com. Here you'll get exclusive access to our private, members-only community of business builders, free business building resources, and live online monthly training designed to accelerate your business success. Join us now at solopreneurcoach.com. Hey, Solopreneurs, it's Steve Combs again. You can find all the show notes for this episode at solopreneurcoach.com forward slash 024. And as we mentioned in today's episode, David will deliver a free live training to share his best cash flow management secrets with members of my Solopreneur Success Connections community on June 25th. That's next week. If you're not yet a member, I invite you to join us. New members can use discount code SS30FREE, that's SS30FREE, to get their first 30 days free. There's never an obligation to continue, but I know once you start enjoying the twice-monthly live expert-led training sessions, the twice-monthly virtual networking sessions, and the many other member benefits, like the new member deals one I announced just last week, you'll want to stick around. So come join us. You'll find that code and link along with today's show notes at solopreneurcoach.com forward slash 024. See you next week.